what you're all thinking. You're saying, you're supposed to start at eight. It's 11 minutes past. You're late. We are late. Sorry about that. Few little technical glitches, but now the good news is we're here. And this is Spoonie Vision Live, and I am Kate Humble, wearing, it has to be said, a slightly odd outfit, which I'll explain a little bit later. But you guys are in for such a treat because tonight you are going to hear about what I think of as one of modern times most just brilliant adventures. It's a story of daring, of tenacity, of heart-rending emotion and all for the sake of one tiny funny looking bird. Coming up on tonight's ITV News at 10, the most endangered birds in the world, and why a small flock here could be the saviours of the species. Fewer than 200 spoon-billed sandpipers are thought to be left in the world. I was just overwhelmed by the extraordinary story, really. It's sort of James Bond of the bird world. This is one of the most endangered species in the world. These are spoon-billed sandpipers. And to get here, conservationists have brought them on an incredible journey from the far east of Russia. So let's just take a little bit of a look at that journey. It was a phenomenal task and something that we would normally spend months preparing for, but we didn't have the luxury of time. We had to basically get out to Russia as quickly as possible. Probably the hardest bit was before leaving with your family and sort of dawns on you that you know, you're not going to see them for a while. <laughs> This expedition is one of the most ambitious and challenging expeditions that I know that's ever been undertaken to save a species. Having worked on waders for the last 40 years, this is the biggest conservation issue I've ever been involved in. It's the most exciting thing I've seen in my life. <laughs> I've never been anywhere in my life like this. So this pioneering conservation project is run from here. I am sitting at the WWT headquarters at Slimbridge in Gloucestershire and I've been joined by my friend and, don't listen Nigel, because you'll get big headed, conservation hero, Nigel Jarrett. Thank you, um, Now Nigel, you, you've really been the driving force behind the Spoonie project since it started. Is it four years ago now? It is, 2011. Four, yeah. I can't believe it, time goes so fast. Before we get into the nitty gritty, like the important stuff, why we're wearing this kit for a start, let's think about this little bird. It is, as I say, a tiny little wading bird that lives far, far away from the UK. It does an extraordinary migration, but it never comes here. So why should we care about the Spoonbill Sandpiper? Well, unfortunately for it, it is the, the dodo of our time. This bird is headed for extinction. Right. There's nothing else like it. Uh, not only has it got this very odd shaped bill, it's got a beautiful breeding plumage where it looks like it's got all of the colours of autumn leaves on, it, on itself. Its feather coat in summer becomes like shining armour, very wow. silvery. Um, but what is special about the bird is where it lives, it breeds in Arctic Russia, the mm -hmm. far, far northeast of Russia, migrates about 5,000 miles to wintering areas in the, in the tropics, places like Maya. save the Spoonbill Sandpiper, not only do we save it that's headed for extinction because yeah. there's only a few hundred pairs of them, but we save a myriad other species and thousands upon thousands of other individual birds and other wildlife species that are living alongside it. So it, but it is a little, it's a flagship species, it's exactly, a sort of yes. perfect for, for somebody, um, as I say, at the forefront of, of conserving a species like this, having something that's so recognisable and, I mean I know this is just a fluffy one folks, but you know, We'll, we'll see some real ones in a minute. You've seen them on film. Um, they are an adorable looking bird. Does that help 
when it comes to conservation, having something that people will instantly recognise and, it, you know, feel for. Yes, definitely. And for those birders out there, people who know about birds, the spoonbill sandpiper is the kind of holy grail of species. Everybody wants to see one before, yeah. before they stop bird watching or worse. And uh, it, it is just a beautiful animal and it's something that we don't know much about. It's, it's declined quite rapidly over the last 20 years and it could disappear without us knowing anything about it. Right. Like why that strange bill yeah but it's worth saving just like all the species that are living alongside us in wetland places and in other habitats too so now let's let's explain to everybody um first of all why we're wearing these outfits and then secondly where we are because i you know this is isn't your your regular television studio is yeah. it what, what why are we dressed like this well because the sandpiper was headed for extinction um a, a lot of folk were concerned about that and we decided to form an arced population to, to bring birds into a, a conservation breeding program so at least we could safeguard the bird from extinction right. while we found out about its threats and how we could remove those threats in nature mm -hmm. and ultimately save it as a species and all the other birds and animals that live alongside it. We're living or we're now sat in the bird's living space at Slimbridge which is biosecure as we can make it and by biosecure I mean we keep out all of the nasties the biological nasties like disease mm -hmm. and predators mm -hmm. that could harm the birds. Mm -hmm. uh, we're actually sat in a breeding enclosure right now which has been landscaped to resemble, you wouldn't think you're looking around at this time of night, but in the springtime when we have pears in these places the vegetation is very short and it's very right. like the arctic tundra, albeit in Gloucestershire. S so effectively you have created here, you've got, we've got Nige Cam brilliant this. Get, get, get your camera out okay, live. I'm not so, sure so, if I can make this phone. work. Um, but, uh, and just bear in mind, we There's are live, beaming at you via the internet. Um, so if things go down, bear with us. Um, but you are basically showing us, so we've got some sort of little humps and bumps here. Um, and uh, so Nigel Cam isn't working quite yet. But can any of our other cameras, come on guys, stop standing there. I think I forgot to press Play. Did you forget or, to press play? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> See, Nigel, Nigel is absolutely brilliant with birds, with eggs, with any of that stuff. Not so techy. No, you, no. Well, not actually, so someone, the, the runner has literally run off with it, so I think it might not have been my fault <laughs> in the end. But, but while, while we're here, hold on. While we're here, just uh, so you know, obviously, uh, you can get in touch with us uh, throughout the broadcast. If you've got any questions for us, uh, do send them in. Um, get in touch with us uh, via the internet, and uh, we will try and answer your questions either during the broadcast or afterwards. We're going to have a little Q&A session. So, sorry, Nigel. Okay, well, I was about to say that yeah. in front of us, we've got a mock-up that we used at the National Bird Fair last right. year and the year before, which shows a, a, a wooden decoy, if yeah. you like, spoonbill sandpiper, a little bit larger than life size, and it's approaching a nest of artificial eggs, but these really are almost life size, and you can see they're not much bigger than my thumbnail, and the nest scrape is made in what looks like dead vegetation, right. which is what the birds find when they arrive in the Arctic okay. in June, when they fly from their wintering overwintering areas and in Myanmar through China up to the Arctic. Very dead, very barren, but their plumage uh, and egg colours allows the, the nest to, to kind of be camouflaged and not to be found by predators. And what we try to do here at Slimbridge is recreate some of that by carefully managing the grass and the seed and plants at my feet yeah. to a short height so the birds can move around it easily. We've got some low hummocks that we've created so that the birds can really get out of each other's way or hide from any external disturbances because although this is you know biosecure to keep out other birds and animals yeah. they can actually see things flying around right. on the outside so we allow a little bit of natural history if you like to invade their space yeah but we control predation risks all within this space which is about five meters by ten meters where we um, want the birds to breed um but you know, you've you've got a bird, as you said, uh, right at the at the beginning of this. You've got a bird that migrates from, you know, yep. the very north of Russia, right down to five thousand kilometers, five thousand kilometers, five thousand miles rather, to to you know a whole different yep. sort of habitat. And, and so, so we have to try and create the habitat that the birds live in year round. Right. And although we're not, I'm not I'll, I'll take you to their wintering habitat now. It's not five thousand miles away. <laughs> it's about. <laughs> <laughs> five and a half metres away. But now the breeding season is at its close. Yeah. It's ended. We've um, put the bird, we've 
the birds were in pairs, we've now moved them into a wintering flock situation. I'll right. talk quietly because we're approaching them now. Look, now this um, is Nikki, isn't it? In yeah, here? Nikki um, cares for the birds daily with another member of the team who isn't here today. But um, it is obviously dusk now. We've got some artificial light cr creating nat natural dusk. Yeah. Um, the, the birds are still moving from the far north south, but we've moved them to effectively a, their wintering area, which is a large, shallow pool of salt water. These birds live in what we call intertidal zones, you know, the, the bit of land, mud flats right. between the sea and land. And they're used to foraging for small crustaceans and other creepy crawlies that live in damp sand. What Nikki's doing now is putting some crickets and some bloodworms, yeah. which the birds can find in the damp sand and in the water. Um, we can actually switch, if it's not already happened, to a bullet cam to get some real close-ups of the birds. I think um, at the they... moment that camera's not working, but uh, Sam's doing a great job here. Um, so what you're trying to do is, is give them as natural a habitat as possible. Yeah, and we try to create the, the, the environment, the social environment that they live in too. So right now they're in a flock. We've got 24 birds here. They're molting still from summer plumage. Right. Remember I told you about all the colours of autumn. Yeah, yeah. The leaves that you see in their plumage. Those feathers have been dropped and they're replacing them with silvery grey feathers. I'm not sure if people can see them at home, but they do shine like a night armour uh, when they're in the full winter plumage. Um, so we feed them according to the time of year. We increase the protein levels in their diet, pre-breeding, drop it as they enter winter plumage, and, and you know we might, we've migrated them in effect to, to the wintering areas. But you see, now you're saying this as if somebody had written a book about how to look after spoonbill sandpipers, but no one's done this before, have they? Mm. How how do you know what to do? Well, we we know what similar birds do. Right. In terms of their annual cycle, we know that they breed in the far north and they nest in low vegetation that they find on tundra landscapes and we know that they live on, on shorelines. So we've tried to create the, the two extremes in this small space, space we have at Slimbridge. And as you can see, the bite, I don't know if you can really see it this time of night, but the birds are bright eyed, alert, very active, yeah, yeah. fitting well and doing all the right things for spoonbill sandpipers albeit in quite an artificial situation. So, and now you said that there are only a few hundred pairs left. Looking at these birds here, I mean, does this represent actually quite a significant um, proportion of the world's population of spoonbill sandpipers? Yes, we're, we're, st we're still not entirely sure how many spoonbill sandpipers are out there, but it is in the low hundreds. And so perhaps we've got maybe five Six percent of the world population living here. Um, I do have some other places to show you. Go on then. So that's the birds overwintering area right. at Slimbridge. We've been sat in quite a large breeding enclosure. Right. But we have a few of the smaller ones. So you've got a large here. breeding enclosure. Why then have smaller because, ones? Because we we want to get it right for the birds. Our experience with pairs last year yeah. was that they didn't quite fall in love sufficiently well. So, it, so, <laughs> so, so they we needed little private so boudoirs. Exactly, so we feel that it was necessary for the birds to be brought together and right. to have, a, have visual barriers, if you like, between adjacent pairs. So in, the, in nature, they're very territorial. Right. They defend their territories. Yeah. If they can see birds in adjacent areas, perhaps that has put them off in the past. This year, we kept them in smaller spaces where they could be, you know, like this, very close, snugged up, snugged up and uh, not able to see each other, to interfere right. with each other. And so, yeah, this is the, so obviously we're in late summer now, so the vegetation is beginning to die back, but you can see it was managed, so we had a low um, lawn height, sward yeah. height, yeah. with some dead vegetation for them to make the nests in, and some taller flowering with grasses which have now flowered um, and are seeding. Um, to, to, to hide I'm just going to go and have a little peep in here. And, and all the while we're providing fresh water right. in shallow pools. We've, we've emptied the sand substrate that was in there yeah. because we're now you know, in, in closed down, tidy up period. But the water's kept clean by using a, a, a watercress filter. One of the pools, oh, every other pool really? we have contains watercress, which we know is very good at taking out nutrients, the nitrates that the birds might poop out into, into water, yeah. so we're able to keep the, the system 
clean and as I said before I used that word by secure yeah. as safe as possible. So everything is in. about keeping it lovely and as you say lovely and clean and secure uh, and fresh, yeah. but also romantic and the whole point of this project is well trying to encourage those little spoonies to spoon and the staff were very very keen that it should work this year. I think if we were to get chicks this year it would be uh, probably above all a massive morale boost and so every every success gives us another boost to keep going. To see the birds here produce eggs and then chicks would be absolutely amazing. That's like all we've been working for this whole time. It's just, it would be such a big breakthrough. I think the, the highlight for me was the first day when I went in with Nikki and one of the birds started nest scraping. And to be able to observe that was amazing. And it, you know, we, we just thought, oh, we're going to get eggs now. You wait all year for this small window of time where it might happen, then the next minute you're thinking like, oh no, don't get your hopes up. Look, we've got to keep level head. We've got to work really hard and we just don't know yet. If we can start breeding them, not only are we sustaining that population, but hopefully we're taking a big step towards producing an excess of eggs, which could go back to Russia to be hatched and the babies reared there and released so that they can join the flyway with their wild brothers and sisters. So, burning question. Did all your hard work, all your careful planning, all your boudoir design work? Did you get eggs? We didn't. <gasps> um, yeah, sorry to disappoint with that, that fact, but we did get a lot of positive behaviours that actually indicated to us that the birds were going to breed at any, right. any point. Did you film any of that? Uh, we, we did, and uh, what we recorded was lots of male display. Right. The males were really very am amorous, if you like, towards the, the females. Let's ask if our guys, techie guys, have you got any of this lovely stuff on film that we can show everybody? Okay, oh, there we go. So there, there we, are. There we yeah. have a male making, he's using his chest to make a little depression in, in, the, in the sedum plants. This is, this is amazing, it looks like you're on the tundra and this is actually here yeah, at Cambridge. In their time, you can see the vegetation is very short, but yeah. move around, there's a, a pool with um, a, a male singing defending his territory um, against other males. There's another one stood on one of these low mounds that we've got. And can we just be... And here, this is quite a bit, bit of argy-bargy that we saw. The males yeah. started to fight, and um, this was all positive for us to see. We, we knew that this is leading in one direction, which is pairing and hopefully successful copulation and egg laying. The male there's chased away another male, and then he starts following the female. And here's a boy singing. On top of the mound, the female approaches um, what, what he's doing there is, is basically saying, here I am, where are you, yeah. which to come together. He's also calling to the birds in adjacent areas, saying, keep out. Um, and so the birds were doing all the right things, song fighting too, getting up like skylark, singing in the sky, coming down, making nest scrapes. We recorded over 109 nest scrapes being made, or nest scrape behaviours, in one day. Wow. And uh, this is it. as far as it got, unfortunately, where a female, the females, whatever, just go and peer over the male's shoulder, right. step into a nest scrape, but there was never any follow up never. with eggs. So do, do we know why? How, I mean, first of all, how old are these birds? They are able to breed. They're at the they're, right they're age. At the right yeah, age. They're, they're three and four years old this year. Now, and, and let's just be clear, these birds were not captive, ca captured in the wild and no. brought here, were they? they? They were collected as eggs off the Russian tundra. Right. Um, the first batch was hatched in Russia, then brought here when they were about three months old. The second yeah. batch arrived as unhatched eggs. We hatched them in our quarantine station. We hatched all the viable eggs that we arrived back with, 17 in total, were raised. And we now have this population of 24 birds. So they came from a wild source. Yeah. But the life has always been always within been this. So we, we couldn't program. blame the fact that they haven't uh, yet bred on the fact that they've been sort of disrupted, they've been taken out yeah, of a wild environment. This is the only environment they've ever known. That's right. Do you have any clues as to why you saw all that wonderful behaviour but they haven't quite well, got to the egg laying stage yet? I don't know if you, um, maybe if people are going to watch this later on the YouTube, they could look at the, the plumages of the two birds mm. at the end. The males acquired full breeding plumage, the females didn't. And what we know is an important trigger for plumage development or molt is for a period, the type of light and the length of light that they receive. Right. So we didn't manage the, the light artificially in, in the places that we, we keep the birds, but we're obviously not getting something quite 
you know, Quite perfect right. because the females aren't getting into that condition, that plumage condition that we'd normally see with wild birds breeding in the Arctic. But we, we, we are, you know, we're doing everything we can. We haven't given up yet. No. This is a, a, a population that we need to keep going because one day its progeny might start new colonies of spoonbill sandpipers in the wild. And it hasn't all been gloomy, spoony news, nope, has it? Nope. We've been joined by Roland, another no. hero of mine. Um, Roland, you have just hot-footed it back from Russia. Again, you've been involved in this project right from the very start. Uh, tell me what you were doing in Russia uh, um, just now. Just now, we've just had our most successful season um, head starting spoonbill sandpipers. Okay, now tell me what head starting means. Um, head starting is um, rather than using a captive bred population, what we're doing is we go out to the breeding grounds um, mm -hmm. and we collect the first clutch of eggs very early. So as soon as a full clutch of eggs has been laid, we will go in, we'll collect that clutch of eggs. So effectively, I'm going to be a little bit you know, contentious here. Effectively, you go in and steal eggs yes. from the adult birds. I'm a professional egg thief. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you heard it here first. <laughs> we're, we're, we're thieving, though. Has it, he returns what he's stolen? Right. Uh, so yes. Ex birds. Explain how it works. So what we found out is by taking the first clutch of eggs very early. Yeah. The pair of birds then relay a second replacement clutch. We incubate artificially and rear the spoonbill sandpipers and release them. And in that way, we're bolstering the population. Um, we're increasing the population something like about sixfold for fledging young spoonbill sandpipers. Naturally, in the wild, it's an average of 0.6 chicks per pair. We are getting three or just over three chicks per pair. That's and so, and over four four years, Roland's released uh, with the Russian team over eighty spoonbill sandpiper chicks. Yeah, so okay, but that that's only one part of the story, isn't it? If you're yeah. releasing eighty spoonbill sandpiper chicks over four years, but we need to know whether they're coming back and are they breeding? Mm. Have you got that data yet? Yes, we do. Um, one of the things we've done with all of the chicks is we fit a flag on, so an individually marked flag. Yeah. So we've been able to tell initially with the young birds that not only were they migrating, but they were migrating to the correct wintering areas. We were getting them recited in Thailand, How China. How do they do that? It's, it's just innate. It's there, it's hardwired, it's programmed into them. Because they don't they, migrate with the adults, do no, they? No, it's a different route, and it's a different route. It's um, different times. So we were able to tell, well, at least the birds initially, when we first did the trial, well, the birds actually migrated. They left Minor Pilgrina. And that's, then, that's the area in yeah, Siberia. Yeah. yeah. And then we were later on, we were able to tell, well, they've actually made it down to Thailand. Um, and then last year we had our first bird from the trial, Line Green 8. She actually made it back to Chukotka and she managed to breed. So when we found them she had a clutch with her mate a wild male of three eggs and from that we assume and they were quite late laid yeah that they were probably a replacement clutch so right. their first clutch might have been predated and they produced a replacement clutch of three eggs from those one egg hatched um into and the male reared the chick one egg was infertile and one egg, unfortunately, the chick died on as it was trying to hatch, which right. is something that does appear to happen quite often. And she came back again this year and raised Did the same again. again. Did the same again. So and, and, it's and what, others I mean, have returned too. So. I, know, I know it's early days. I mean, four, four years is, is a very yeah. short yeah, yeah. time for such an extremely pioneering uh, project as this. But is it, is it possible to say... Do you feel tentatively optimistic that it's working? Tentatively optimistic, yes. We had a very good return this year from our 2013 birds. Mm -hmm. We know that at least 15 migrated. From those 15, three returned to the breeding grounds, um, which that's sort of 20% returning, which is pretty much what you'd expect for wild birds and like that. And can we put into context for our loyal viewers out there, you know, this is no picnic. 
Going out to Siberia, I mean, you're working in conditions which are absolutely brutal, really, aren't you? Just yeah. tell us some stories. Um, it's, it's kind of funny, the field work. You have to... I've done a fair bit of field work, a fair bit of surveying work in the UK, and so if you have different things to watch out, watch out for the bull if you're crossing a field. Well, we're working in Chukotka, we're having to watch out for bears. There are a lot of bears there. Really? Yeah, it's a um, yeah, big number. It varies year to year, but you do come across quite a few bears. We get really good advice from the Russians, and as long as you follow the protocols, the bears actually, you know, they're big and scary. But what is the protocol? What do you do when you see The a protocol, bear? basically, you've got to stand your ground. There's one thing you mustn't do from a bear is you must never run away. If you run, then it's going to set off a predator prey, and a bear's a much faster runner than you are. And if you see chococker, it's very open. There yeah, are no trees there's nowhere to climb. To hide. No. And, and it's not just the big, the big predators. Um, mm. I remember Martin McGill, who we saw in the very opening film, uh, your colleague who went out on the first uh, Russian expedition, um, uh, having mosquitoes hoovered off him. I yeah. mean, it, th there it's are mo moving with them, yeah. Um, it's the mosquitoes, it's kind of bittersweet. They're awful, but if there weren't all the mosquitoes, there wouldn't be the waders. Right. Um, where we do the outdoor rearing, so our spooners are reared inside for seven days, but after seven days, we take them out onto a marsh and we rear them outside in a sort of rearing stroke release pen. Being a marsh in the Arctic, yeah. it is absolutely moving with mosquitoes. Um, I mean, I've seen pictures where the, I mean, the air is absolutely thick with yeah, them. Yeah, it, it can be. It, it varies. It depends on the weather. If there's a bit of wind, it's quite good. But yeah, generally, yeah, it can be horrendous. You it, can... It makes going to the loo very, very good. Yeah. <laughs> Normally, it averages about 20 bites. And you... What, for one pea? For one pea, yeah. And that's just a pea, so... <laughs> The things you guys do yeah. for these little birds. <laughs> Roland, thank you. Don't go away. Stick with us. And we've probably got questions coming in. But um, WWT's chief scientist is Jeff Hilton. And he has done it. He couldn't be with us tonight, sadly. But he's done a video for us, which really sums up the success of this project, but also sets up one of the other great challenges that this team has to face. Job is to sort of try and design the science that will help us to guide what we do for Spoonable Sandpipers. I mean, this is an incredibly difficult project, and and you're always kind of doubting: can we really save this thing? You know, things are so dire because everything was so desperate. It was seat of the pants. We knew that you know that there's, there's nothing to lose anymore with Spoonable Sandpipers. They're, they're, they're going. Uh, and so it's kind of been liberating. People have just said, well, let's give it a go because we've got nothing to lose. And it, and it actually helps because you, you become less risk averse and you just get on with it. Conservation organisations have all just said, yeah, we want to get involved. It's almost like the Spoonbill Sandpiper arrived at the right time and the right place and just inspired a lot of people collectively. And, and then it's built this momentum. When we did the number crunching after we'd done the counting, the numbers look really, really positive. So it looks like numbers have, have been stable for maybe five years which doesn't sound that great but you have to remember they were declining at 25 percent per year up till that point so it looks to us as if we've arrested the decline uh, you know a fantastic sign that in this short medium term we do actually seem to have stopped this thing going extinct i think really sort of looking to the future what i want to see is just step by step peeling back these problems that are affecting spoonbill sandpiper we've already got on top of the hunting in Myanmar, but we've got to keep it up. All the all the bird killing that's going on in China at the Rudong stopover site, if we can stop that, and I'm sure we can in the next year or two, that's another step. And then the big one is the big development projects in Korea and China that are destroying mudflats that the birds need. There is a bit of there is a bit of a sort of a thing in conservation circles that, that the sort of the industrialization of East Asia is just unstoppable. You can't, you know, these people are developing so fast, there's so much capital involved, you can't stop them building big developments. And I don't believe that. People don't want to destroy nature. If you tell them where the nature is important and how they could do alternate do it in a different way, I think you can persuade them to make their big developments in appropriate places. And I think if we can demonstrate that by say, averting the destruction of the Rudong stopover site, 
that would be a massive statement that, you know, we don't need to despair. I think sometimes I think we're a bunch of pessimists in conservation. We can win this. I don't know about you, but I am really, really proud of the guys here at WWT. They are doing an amazing job for this little bird. And it doesn't make their job easy because, as you know now, it migrates 5,000 miles. That's an enormous amount of territory to look after. And if you're going to do you know, successful uh, conservation of this bird. You can't just concentrate on the project here at Slimbridge. You can't just concentrate on the breeding grounds in Russia. You have to look at that whole migratory route. And I've been joined now by Rich Hearn. And Rich, you are about to head off to Rudong in yeah, China yeah. Uh, to do what? To do surveys and also to try and catch birds as well. We want to fit more colour marks to, to individual spoonbill sandpipers. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but it, it does seem, you know, seeing Jeff's report... Conservation initiative um, for spoonies, that, you know, they have representatives on the task force for spoonbill sandpiper and so on. And whilst we're all very aware of things like the industrialisation of China that's very rapid, other yeah. things are changing very rapidly as well. So in, uh, environmental awareness, interest in natural history are also growing very rapidly. Is that true? I mean, it's lagging behind like it does in most places, yeah. but it's still coming along, and that gives us a really good opportunity to raise awareness of, of you know, the importance of these mud flats and other things as well. I mean, is there, is there I don't know, do, do, are there people in China who, who like to go bird watching for pleasure? Yeah, definitely. There's lots of them. Yeah. Really? Yeah, there's a, there's a big network of bird watching societies in China now. So uh, they were next. Quite a Ten years ago, there were practically none of them, and now there's thousands. Well, there's hundreds of clubs, and there's thousands of people interested. So and do I mean you? You know, it, it it seems funny that there is a great sort of fondness in this country for the spoonbill sandpiper because yeah. it is such an iconic little bird. Yeah. But you know, do you do you get a sense that um, that the Chinese sort of have a pride that this bird spends, albeit a short amount of time, but you know, as you said, a very crucial part of their life cycle in their country, on their territory. Yeah, well, well some, some people definitely do. There's yeah. absolutely no doubt about it. The trick is persuading the people that make the decisions that they need to care as well, yeah. and that's always the battle, obviously. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do, so that these planned developments at Rudong are not as extensive as they are currently proposed to be, so that they develop in a way that makes room for all these shorebirds. So there's 150,000 shorebirds at Rudong in, in wow. the autumn. It's not just the spoonies. Yeah. All of the world's northern and green shanks stop over there, and you know tens and tens of thousands of other things as well. So again, it goes back to this idea of you know if you can do your absolute utmost to uh, help the conservation of this little bird, yeah, you're actually supporting hundreds of thousands of others. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And do you, I mean, big question, um, do you feel a little bit optimistic? What do you expect you're going to see when you get over there this year? Lots of waders. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully a few spoonies in some nets as yeah, well. Yeah. So we'll be catching them, you know, we're trying to catch spoonies in mist nets to, to, to mean we've got more marked birds in the population. That gives us good information on survival and population size and stuff. Yeah. So yes, but I mean, yeah, I suppose the, the main thing I would want to see is that the sea walls there haven't got any bigger. That would be brilliant. That would they can build a sea wall <laughs> so quickly. <laughs> if there's none uh, that, weren't, that were there last year, then that'd be brilliant. Yeah. Good. Well, keep us posted. Yeah. Um, there will be updates, of course, on the WWT website. You have sent in so many questions. So we're actually going to have a sort of dedicated Q&A after this live broadcast. But I just wanted to, uh, well, really wrap up now. We're almost out of time. But uh, I'm going to leave you with one final, very important message. Can I just say something? Dig out your bank cards. If we can save the Spoonbill Sandpiper, I think there'll be two things we've learned. The first is you don't need to give up on any species. You know, this is this is almost the quintessential unsavable species, or at least it was five years ago. It looked like you, there's no chance. If we pull it off, it will be a message to say you need never give up, um, because if you put enough in, you, you can save it. That's, that's the th first thing. The other thing is we know it's, it's the forerunner of a whole load of species that are in big trouble in East Asia because of the, the problems on that flyway with habitat destruction and hunting. If we save the spoonbill sandpiper, we will, by definition, be saving a whole bunch of species which are going to hit trouble in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, so it, it's the rarest of the lot, but there's plenty of other species going the same way 
in Asia at the moment. And if we turn it around for spoonbill sandpipers, there's a whole flyway of birds that we'll be benefiting. Saving the spoonbill sandpiper is a huge task. It's a very exciting task and it's a very difficult task. And we are completely indebted to all the people who have supported us financially and with, with encouragement and enthusiasm for the last several years. It is going really well. I think we can save the species, but it's a long job. And so I really would also ask, please keep supporting us. Thank you very much. And please keep supporting us because we can do this. So this has been Spoonie Vision Live, the very, very first broadcast of its type anywhere in the world. And uh, thank you all very much indeed for watching. We've had the most fantastic lot of questions, so um, no rushing off to the pub, boys. Um, our first question um, is a great one. Uh, it comes from Suzanne Bourne. She's, she's got in touch with us via Facebook. And she says that her 10-year-old daughter, Poppy, has fallen in love with these so cute birds. Aren't they, Poppy? They're adorable. Um, so she asks, burning question, I'm dying to hear what you say, why are their beaks like that? Who'd like to well, answer, answer that? that? I, think, I think the honest answer, or the, at, the, at present we don't know, but there must be a good reason, otherwise it wouldn't be there. Right. And we're not even sure if that thing has evolved to just get the birds over maybe a few weeks of hard times when food's hard to find. What we plan to do this autumn is some experiments where we can actually find out if there are something called electroreceptors in there. Right. That, that, you know, the things that um, hammerhead sharks have on the ends of their what, noses. To help, them, to help them sort of sense where food might yeah, be or something like we, that? We're going to investigate that possibility. It might be that it's just rampacked with with other sensory nerves yeah. and so on, you know, organs that enable the birds to find mood, uh, food beneath the water surface or in mud or in the snow when they first arrive in Russia. Or it could even be just that, just that you know, having that bulbous bit increases the surface area and it makes it easier to catch things. Yeah. They do you, grab you, stuff you grab. a lot. They don't necessarily yeah. do that. Right. You might imagine that they feed like a spoonbill, yeah. but a lot of the time they do just grab do. things. I mean, I've uh, seen them do yeah. that, and with mosquitoes and things, they'll yeah. grab, won't they? And little crabs which, and all sorts of stuff. Which yeah. can actually do a really good impression of a spoonbill sandpiper <laughs> feeding, <laughs> because he, he's, he's observed different behaviours in, in China right. and seen them become... Yeah, they walk around like this, and they don't... You'd think they'd be walking along like a dunlin and doing yeah, that. Yeah, doing that. they're walking around really upright and sort of like jabbing their head into the into the water and just like grabbing things, picking things Which up. suggests they're actually using really their eyes and they can see yeah. something. They're definitely they're using yeah. their eyes to, yeah. to grab things. Yeah. But see, I thought answer, they had a bill that shape. I don't know about you, Poppy, but I thought they had a bill that shape because it made eating ice cream easier. Could be. See, you could just scoop up. Stick that in your experiment. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had another one in from James in Bath. He emailed us. Uh, this one's for you, Roland. He says, what's been your scariest moment with a bear? Um, in 2013, um, Nikki came out with me. Um, this is Nikki, who's with the birds out yeah. there that we yeah. met earlier, yeah. Um, and we were doing the post-release monitoring, but Nikki was really ill that day. So I said to Nikki to stay in the Vizger hut, which is that um, armour-plated caterpillar truck that yeah. we stay in. Yeah. Um, I would go out and do the post-release monitoring on the marsh. Um, I was walking along surveying and I saw a bear maybe 120 metres away from me. They've not got very good eyesight. He was walking to the north to where the rivers enter this big lake and where the salmon are all spawning. So I thought, well, he can go his way um, and I will go my way. Yeah. I carried on walking, surveying, didn't think much about it. All of a sudden he just looked round and he just made this big loop and started running towards me. <laughs> um, not what you want. It's not really what you not want. What this you was want. a very big male bear. I also realised he was a very thin male <coughs> bear, which is the other thing That's that another thing want you to don't see. want. So he's fast and yeah. hungry. And he came to, it just took like a second, and this bear had sort of covered 40 metres, and it sort of come in a loop around Jeez. behind me. I sort of just remembered in my head what... Pavel and Nikolai had told me about what to do in encounters like that and it's I looked at the Vestia hut was about 300 meters away and this bear was 80 meters away from me so I knew I couldn't sort of run and make it to the Vestia hut so I just stood my ground I made myself look as big as possible and shouted and the bear just screeched to a halt and he just suddenly realized I was a 
perfect human and he just ran and ran and <laughs> ran and I could see him disappearing over the top of these moraine hills and then I'd see him coming up the other side and he no carried way. on running for maybe best part of a mile and what we realised afterwards, or I realised after, was actually the bear, he could only really just see a shape, he couldn't make out what I was. Right. The way the wind was blowing, he couldn't smell me and that's his main sense is his sense of smell so actually all he'd done he'd done this big loop around to smell to me to see what i was then as he came round he suddenly saw me make myself look big and he and had he the fright it. of his life <laughs> <laughs> but it was probably until this day it was the most lonely moment <laughs> of my life <laughs> <laughs> and i never ever felt so <laughs> alone <laughs> so, but i say normally the bears aren't a problem you just a bit yeah. of common sense, yeah. you know, and yeah. they do their thing, we do ours, and you know, we keep out of each other's way. <laughs> We've had um, uh, another uh, question in from Carrie from Gloucester. I think this one should be for you, Nigel. It's a really interesting one. She asks, if you raise birds in captivity, so like our birds here at Slimbridge, how do they know to stay away from predators? Well, the they don't really have to because we keep the predators out yeah. um, and those birds that hopefully will hatch here one day will never be released directly into the wild so being able to escape from predators is not something they will have to do in their lives while they're with us. Right. Um, I hope that answers the question. I think, I think it does yeah. and I suppose the, the ones that you're he raising... Has to he has to train the birds we, to we, be afraid. Yeah, sorry, yeah, we do um, aversion training so we did have, I don't know if I've managed to find any of the film, but there is a little bit of film of the people who um, arrange things for us, um, who we stay with, who sort out accommodation, food, and basically everything, mm. flights for us, Roman and Sveta. They have got this huge, amazing dog called Nord. Um, it's sort of a bit of everything. And we, we actually, we can see that. They've got the footage up for us. So we get Nikolai and Nord with the aid of sort of a big piece of bread to keep luring him along. Um, they'll walk up around the pen and I will keep myself um, kind of tucked down behind a bush and I will play the alarm call on the speaker. And you can actually see in the, in the footage the birds running away to the far end right. of the enclosure yeah. in response to that dog's presence and the alarm call and that sets it and that just sets it at hard it's it's there buried in their mind so once they've seen that and once they've heard the call and um, with something they recognize as a threat such as a dog yeah, which they see yeah. like a wolf or a fox yeah. then that's it's hardwired in their heads Brilliant. and um the russians have got some amazing they've done some amazing work with these birds they've got all of the different calls including the call to come out of hiding so what we do is we play the alarm call the birds will run to the end of the aviary and hide then when Nikolai walks away with Nord, I'll play the call to come to out come of hiding out and, and the birds to start brilliant. doing. Absolutely well, was brilliant. It, oh, was it Carrie, questions coming in thick and fast. Just to say, it was, was it Carrie who asked that it question? It was Carrie. We, we don't re really need the birds to be afraid. We don't actually want them to be stressed yeah. in this environment that they're living in in Slimbridge. So we do everything that we, we can for them to have quite charmed lives, really. Right. So that they can focus on, on growing and ultimately breeding yeah so Roland yeah. has to make his birds afraid of predators because otherwise they'll get eaten we don't have to because we keep the, the would-be predators out through these, the nets and the safety barriers around about um, a question that I think a lot of people are going to want to know uh, this come from Neil H on Facebook he said he became a member of WWT well done. Anyone who isn't a member, become a member now. Neil did, and it's absolutely worth it, isn't it, Neil? He became a member because he wanted to fund projects like this. Brilliant, he says. Thank you, um, but, but he wants to know, can he see the Spoonies the next time he comes to Slimbridge? Not, not in the feather or the flesh, unfortunately, because, as I said at the very beginning, we we keeping the birds in a biosecure place. Yeah, um, see, we're not you, you'd have Neil, you'd have to wear this outfit. Really, it's not good. It's not really look at look, none of it. <laughs> Doesn't suit any of us. It's yeah. So obviously, I don't think we answered the question why we wear this. We stop stops hairs falling out of our head and yeah. keeps any fibres that might fall on the floor from our clothes that could wrap around the birds' feet. Um, at present, we want to focus on getting the birds breeding, and when the time comes that we've got. Wouldn't it be great to have more spoonbill sandpipers than we can cope with? We might actually have them in places where the okay. public can see them. But we can, you know, arrange for viewing of the birds through the CCTV cameras that we've got dotted around right. the place in our cinema. But unfortunately, 
you know, and it's strong advice from our veterinary team yeah. not, not to allow. Um, so th this is an exceptional situation where we've got this number of people, not just us on these seats, yeah. but the camera crew, just so that we can share the, the activities that we, we do to try mm. and keep these birds safe. Um, and, to, and to ultimately break the good news of rolling success with uh, Head Starting yeah. and the work that Rich and others are doing in the wintering areas. But thank you for your support, Neil. Yes, the it's so, absolutely yeah, brilliant. Not a present, sorry. Um, now, um, Nikki, have you been released from your feeding? Here she is. Come, Nick, 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 come in. Come, come and perch on here with me. Because I've had a question from another yeah. Nick. You see, you look, you look lovely in a hairnet. How does that work? <laughs> um, go on, perch, and I'll, I'm going okay. to crouch here. Um, Nick from Bristol says, what and how much do the spoonies eat each day? Uh, well, they mostly have an artificial diet, although we do try and bulk it out with live food as well, just more for the enrichment side of things. Uh, but they mostly eat dry shrimp, which right. we feed on water, and then they actually have an artificial pellet diet. So it, it's made um, by a company and sent to us, and we're told that this has everything that they should need. So it's kind of got all the right protein levels and everything else that they might need. So it's kind of like a complete diet in one, which saves us a lot of time and worry because we know that they should be getting what they need. Yeah. But they do also get live crickets, which they absolutely love, which is what they were, we were feeding them earlier. I said, yes, now Nick, were you not listening earlier? <sighs> what was the matter with you? You saw Nick and Nicky there feeding them away. So live crickets and, yeah. and bloodworms blood was worms, the other thing. Bloodworms, which are also alive. Right. They're not so nice to look at. They're, no. They're pretty creepy. But, um, <laughs> yeah, they love it. But it is, I mean, as you say, this is, this is a, a, a challenge for anybody looking after any animal in, in, uh, in yes. captivity, is, 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 and particularly animals that you're hoping to breed to give them the most natural environment that you can that they do that they are enriched that they do have to use their yeah. little bird brains yeah. and 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 you and as you say do you I mean it's it's sort of anthropomorphizing a bit but do you see, sense that they get a, a sense of kind of enjoyment that they do seem to really enjoy yeah. uh, kind of hunting for food effectively or, or, or a bit of the chase yeah definitely you know squabbles will break out amongst the birds amongst the more dominant birds because they're like right I'm gonna get this food and I'm gonna fight you for it and yeah it definitely brings out their characters yeah it's, it's good for them it's good for that. them yeah brilliant certainly. well you are doing an amazing job I remember coming here when they just they just come in and you've been looking after them really right from the start haven't you yeah yeah I've been here a while now Bored and, them she, and she's been to Russia too and, and you've been <laughs> well. survived the summer yeah, are, you, <laughs> are you bored of them yet no never 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 uh, nor does it seem our, our viewers. Um, let me see what else we have got here. Uh, oh, okay, how this is from Kevin in Southampton. How many spoonbill sandpipers do you want to reach so they can look after themselves? Oh, that's a that's a really tricky question. Um, I think we'll rephrase that. What do you think will be a viable population? You said, Nigel, right at the beginning of the broadcast that this is our modern day dodo. Uh, it is a bird right on the brink of extinction. We've heard that the work that you've done has perhaps brought them away from the brink. Would that be would that be a not safe thing to say? Not, or is it still not teetering? Not really. The fact that they're using mm. this one place in China called Rudol. Yeah makes them very vulnerable to changes at that one site. It's, it's a major stepping stone that they use on their migration route from the north and the Arctic to their tropical wintering grounds. Right. That, that site isn't safe yet. So, mm. um, so in so a way... So we talk about numbers, yeah. population numbered several thousands of pairs, and it would be nice to be able to say once they hit that number of birds again, yeah. and they're not declining, we were seeing a 26% year on year decline right. a few years ago it would be nice for that to stop and to be a 26 percent increase yeah. but really what we've got to think about is the places where they live and protection of those places because we might get them up to 3,000 in 10 years time but if the sites aren't protected it might be that they start declining at 26 percent again or even worse but a faster rate so, so it we, is so we've it got is to a, save the places and I, all the other species that are i was going to say too. i mean this is a, it's a real lesson in conservation this isn't it because i think um, 
sometimes people concentrate on, as you say, an animal, a, a particular species, without actually thinking of the broader picture. The spoonbill sandpiper is probably one species that if you don't think of the broader picture, every effort you do, every mosquito bite you have, every bear that chases you, you know, every <laughs> argument you get to on a Chinese beach, you know, every, every failure that you, mm -hmm. that you have or success that you have is nothing, is meaningless unless you've protected the habitats yeah. that they use. It would be nice to get to a situation where we, we can't count spoonbills and sandpipers because there are so many of them, not because we can't find them, which is what the current situation is. We don't know how many there are because you cannot find them because there's so few. Wouldn't it be nice if there were in countless numbers like the ones were? Mm. That's we, a bit of a yeah. cop-out answer, but... No, well, no, it's, no, it's no, no, it's an absolutely good answer. We're going but, to um, draw to a close, but... Um, we are coming up to the 70th anniversary of WWT next year, big year for the charity. And of course, this whole enterprise, I suppose, started with Peter Scott and uh, that wonderful, iconic Hawaiian goose, the Nene. Do you think the Spoonbill Sandpiper is you know, is the, is the nene of today. Could it be the next species that brings WWT into the no, an, another 70 years of incredible conservation work? Well, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that that is the case, that the bird doesn't become extinct. And so I think, yes, it is. And we will do everything we can to, 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 to make it possible for it to survive. We don't want it to go extinct. It's not going to be the next dodo. Thank you all four of you for joining us this evening. Thanks to all of you for watching. I hope you have been inspired and excited as I have been uh, by the extraordinary story of the Spoonbill Sandpiper. And um, if you feel moved, as I say, to get out your bank cards or just to get onto the WWT website and find out more about the work of this astonishing charity, then do become a member. You can come and visit Slimbridge or all the other centres around the country. Um, but again, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll see you again. Get your spoons out.